Our lecture today is about beams, and of course, the first question is what do we mean by beams? And by beams, uh, we mean structures which can model can be modeled using one-dimensional functions. Um, and for this to be possible, the structure should have two dimensions which are significantly smaller than the third dimension. Uh, the long dimension, we consider it to be the beam axis, uh, and the two smaller dimensions uh, form a plane which is perpendicular to the beam axis, which we call uh, the cross section. So the common example for that is if we are talking about, let us say, a uh, light uh, weight aircraft with a straight wing. So if we look at the wing from top, I'm talking only here about one wing, not the two wings, so it's essentially one side of the wing, uh, which is, let's say, connected to the fuselage here, and we're talking about a straight untapered wing, then this looks like a beam. The direction of the span would be the beam axis, which we are going to call Z. And if we look at the cross-section, cross-section would look like an airfoil, so it would be something like this. And the axes inside the cross-section would be y-axis and x-axis. So this is more or less uh, how it works with, uh, with beams. So if the structure is sufficiently slender in the sense that the length is much larger than the two other dimensions, which in this case means that the length is much larger than the thickness of the airfoil and the cord of the airfoil. In other, uh, uh, other way to express it is to say it's a large aspect ratio wing, then this we can treat as, uh, as a beam. So as we can see here, uh, a beam is described by a single line, which is the beam axis, and as I said, we call it Z. And then we can have, at each point along this axis, we can create a section by going normal to that axis, perpendicular to that axis, and looking at uh, how the section looks like. And as such, we can create an infinite an infinite number, an infinite number of sections. Um, the trick with beams is that what we want to do is to describe the behavior of the structure, in this case a wing, only in terms of functions that depend on the beam axis Z, the beam axis coordinate Z. So, so that's that way we can end up with what we would call a one-dimensional uh, structural theory. So as we did in plates, uh, in plates what we did is we essentially wanted to express the behavior of a three-dimensional body, which is the plate, in terms of two-dimensional quantities which belong to the reference surface. And the way we did it is we essentially expressed the displacement of a general point in the body. Uh, in terms of functions that depended only on x, y, which were the coordinates of the reference surface, and explicitly dependent on z, such that we could eliminate essentially z out, which was the thickness direction in the case of plates, we can, we could, so that we can eliminate it out of the formulation. So here, Again, we do the same. What we try to do is to express the displacement of a general point in the body in terms of functions that depend only on Z and um, 
explicitly uh, dependent on x and y so that we hopefully are able to eliminate the dependence on x and y and end up with a structural theory which depends only on z. Uh, very well, before we proceed, it is good to figure out what are the type of variables we need in order to describe the displacement of a general point in the body. Uh, since we're talking about displacements and we're talking about displacements uh, which vary with z, it is natural to use the three components of displacement of points on the reference axis of the beam itself. And these three displacements would be u, which is function of z, v, which is function of z. These are along x and y, which are in the cross section and w, which is also a function of z. So these three displacements allow us to represent the displacement vector of a point on the reference axis of the beam. So these are fairly convenient variables to use. But they are not enough in order to describe, um, in order to describe the beam. So for example, um, what we can do, we can, we can see that I can have a portion of the beam that looks like this. So this is Z, and let us say this is Y. And it may deform into a form which is like this. You can easily see here that the displacement of every point along um, the beam axis is zero. So points on the axis do not move at all. But this doesn't mean that the displacement of every body, of every point in the body is zero. So it is very clear that the displacements of the reference axis are not enough to describe the displacement of every point in the body. So the question now is what's needed more? What we need actually is also the orientation of the cross section. So essentially what happened in the case I've just described is that the cross section was oriented such that the normal is z and now it rotated a little bit such that the normal now is inclined with a certain angle which is a rotation around x. So this rotation of the cross section or change of orientation of the cross section is also needed in order to describe the displacement of every point in the body. So it's not difficult to see that in addition to the three displacement components, we need to consider three rotation components of the cross section. So the cross section orientation will rotate rigidly and this requires considering three rotations, a rotation around x, which may depend on z, a rotation around y, which may depend on z, and a rotation around z, which itself might depend on z. So essentially, the kinematics of the beam can be described in terms of six variables, three displacements and three rotations. And the trick here is to describe the displacements of a general point in the body due to these six uh, kinematic variables. So it's not difficult to, since we are going to consider only small rotations, it, it is okay for us to use superposition. So 
a general point in the body, if the cross section does not change orientation, its U displacement, and I'm using capital U here to differentiate it from the displacement of the beam axis, is going to be U of Z. V is going to be V of Z, and W is going to be W of Z. So essentially, the three displacements would be uniform for the whole cross-section, because the assumption here is that the shape of the cross-section itself is not going to change. So this is fairly convenient, but what about what happens if we have rotations? If we have rotations, we need to find the change in position due to rigid rotation and superimpose that on um, on our displacements due to change, like displacement of the beam axis itself, the reference axis of the beam. Uh, in order to do that, th there is a mathematical way, which I can state first, is that the po these rotations are rotations about the reference axis of the cross section, yeah, or the reference axes of the cross section. So essentially, a, a general point in the cross section will have a position, which is x, y, and zero, yeah. And this zero here is because these rotations refer to axes which are centered at the particular cross-section we're talking about. Yeah? So they are not about global axes. They are about cross-sectional axes. And already we have this rotation vector. Let us call it theta. And then the displacement due to that, the displacement vector, is going to be theta cross r, and this uh, is from the rules of small rotation. And from there, we can easily deduce that this will be minus theta z y plus theta z x and this will be plus y theta x minus x theta y. So this would be the displacement field of the beam. Uh, due to a rigid motion of each cross section, but the rigid motions themselves may depend on may depend on that. Uh, that's fair enough, uh, although maybe a little bit explanation is not a bad idea. So for example, because we will need this in, when we describe uh, the kinematics of torsion anyways, so I'll sketch uh, how this works for a particular case. So let us say this is a cross section. This is y. This is x. So let us consider a general point here. So this distance here is y. This distance here is x. And let us consider a rotation around z, which is normal to the plane x, y. So when we rotate around z, we are talking about a motion in this direction. Yeah. So there will be two displacements, a U displacement and a V displacement. And it's not very difficult to see that the U displacement is going to be negative and is equal to minus the rotation times the normal distance, which is Y. And V is going to be uh, positive. The displacement in Y direction is positive, And it is rotation times the normal distance which is also x, which is kind of already tells you uh, where the two first two lines come from. And the uh, other terms can be 
easily deduced by doing the same at other planes. So, of course, this comes down to the cross product relation that we have here. All right, so now that we have the displacements, we are able also to compute uh, strains. And the relationship between strains and displacements are, are, uh, is straightforward. So what we have is, for example, epsilon x, which is partial u, partial x. If we recall the definition of u, this is the derivative with respect to x of small u, which is function of z, minus theta z, which is also function of z, times y. So we can easily see that none of these variables are, depends actually on x. So the derivative with respect to x is going to be equal to zero. So epsilon x is zero. The same will go for epsilon y, which is partial v, partial x. Interestingly enough, we'll see also that capital V, which is a 3D displacement of an arbitrary point in the body, does not depend on y at all, because it depends on v, which is the vertical displacement of the center point of the cross-section or the reference axis of the beam plus theta z, which is the twist rotation, which is a rotation around the axis of the beam, which depends itself on z times x, and this also will give us a zero. Uh, sorry, this is, uh, excuse me. Uh, of course, it is derivative with respect to y, sorry. And then we have gamma xy, which is partial u, partial y, plus partial v, partial x. Uh, of course, the first terms, which are rigid, uh, motions of the cross-section, rigid translations, give exactly zero because u and v, small u and small v depend only on z, so they don't depend on x or y. The second term, for partial u, partial y, we get minus theta z. And for partial v, partial x, we get plus theta z. And the sum of these two is zero. So essentially, all the in-plane strains of the cross-section are zero. So the, the strains in the cross-section are zero, which makes sense because we started by assuming that the cross-section does not deform. The shape of the cross-section remains the same. All what, 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 what the displacement field actually represents is a translation and the rigid rotation of the cross-section. So it does make sense that the in-plane strains are zero. So what about the out-of-plane strains? If we calculate epsilon z, we will see that it is derivative with respect to z of capital W, which is derivative with respect to z of small w, which is the displacement of the beam axis, plus y, theta x of z, minus x theta y of z. And this will give us w prime, where a prime is a derivative with respect to z, plus 
y theta x prime minus x theta y prime. So epsilon z is not zero. And it is linearly varying through the cross section. It is linear in x and y. Um, there are two other out of plane strains, gamma xz and gamma yz. It's not difficult to calculate gamma xz and show that it is equal to u prime minus theta y minus theta z prime times y and gamma yz will equal p prime plus theta x plus theta z prime x. So this already gives us the three non-zero strains which are the strains which are out of the plane of the cross-section. Now that we have displacements and strains, we can proceed and go into the virtual work principle. For the virtual world principle, we don't need the actual displacements. We need the, the virtual displacements. So what we're going to do now is to essentially assume virtual displacements of the same form that we assumed so far. So it will be, again, virtual displacements that represent uh, rigid motion and rotation of the cross sections, in which case, we can express our delta u as delta u of z minus delta theta z of z times y, the delta v equals delta v of z plus delta theta z of z times x and delta w equals delta w of z plus y delta theta x of z minus x delta theta y of z. These are exactly the same relations as we had for the displacements themselves. Similarly, we end up with the same relations between the variation in strains and the virtual displacements uh, as we had before. So we will end up with epsilon z, delta epsilon z is delta w prime plus y delta theta x prime minus x delta theta y prime, and that delta gamma x z equals delta u prime minus delta theta y minus y delta theta z prime, and delta gamma y z equals delta v prime plus delta theta x plus x delta theta z prime. So these are our variations of strains. So what does the principle of virtual work tell us? It tells us that w internal equals, of course, all other strains are zero, and the variation of strains are also zero. So to the integration over the volume, 
of the body of sigma z delta epsilon z plus tau x z delta gamma x z plus tau y z delta gamma y z d volume. All other components are zero. So note that we don't say anything about sigma x, tau xy, and sigma y being equal to zero. All what we said here is that the, ver the, the variations of the strain, delta epsilon x, delta epsilon y, and delta e gamma xy are zero. So regardless of the value of the stresses, these terms disappear from the principle of virtual work. So when we look at the virtual work of internal forces, this is what we're left with, which is an integration over volume. Now, before we substitute the strains into the expression for in internal virtual work, virtual work of internal forces, we need to um, split the integrals because th these are integrals over volume so this means integrals over x y and z so we are going to split them in two ways first of all we will have an integration over the area of each cross section followed by integration over the length of the beam so essentially we integrate first with respect to the area of the cross-section and this integration will give us essentially the virtual work of internal forces per unit length of the mean and then we integrate that with respect to delta z in order to integrate the total virtual work in the system. So we proceed now to substitute the expressions for the variations of the strain into uh, the expression for the internal the virtual work of internal forces so doing the substitution uh, we end up with the following expression <coughs> 
So this expression here is just a straightforward substitution. Now we need to keep in mind that these underlying terms here do not depend on x or y. So as far as the integration over area is concerned, we can treat these as constants. And from there, we are able to actually identify certain integrals of the stresses over area that are important for the virtual work principle. So we will need, for example, for the first term, we identify integration of over area of sigma z d area. For the second term, we identify the integration of sigma z y d area. And for the third term, we identify sigma z x d area. Yeah. On the other hand, we identify for the fourth term the integration over the area of tau x z d area. The fifth term will give us integration of tau y z d area. And finally, the last term will give us uh, the integration of tau y z minus times x minus tau x z times y the area and these would be the stress resultants or the section resultants let us say that appear in the statement of the virtual work of internal forces of a beam. So let us say that we have a cross section here and we take an element of area of this cross section. So the net forces acting on that small piece of area uh, will depend on the traction vector, of course, that appears when we take the cross section. And since the normal to this cross section here is z, then the traction components are going to be tau x z in x direction, tau y z in y direction, and sigma z in z direction. So sigma z the area will give us the resultant force on that small area in the z direction. And when we integrate, we get the net force in z direction. And this acts as a tensile force that trying to stretch the beam. And this we call the normal force N. The same goes for integration of tau x z d area. This will give us the net force in x direction. This is now a shear force because it is perpendicular to axis of the beam and it is a shear force in the x direction. So this is Sx. And the integration of tau y z d area will give us the net force in y direction. This will be the vertical shear Sy. So now we can identify these three integrals with the net forces acting on the cross section. What about sigma z times y d area? If you look at that, sigma z d area is a force in z direction. If you multiply this by y, which is this distance, we obtain a moment around x. So this is actually the bending moment around x. The question arises whether this bending moment is positive or, or negative. Um, the direction of positive bending moment or negative bending moment that's at least usually adopted has nothing to do with whether the moment vector is around the x-axis or negative x-axis or y-axis or negative y-axis. Uh, 
bending moments are positive if they tend to cause tension in the first quadrant. And Mx this way tends to cause tension in the first quadrant, so it is a positive bending moment. The same goes sigma z, the area is force in z. If I multiply by x, which is this distance, excuse me, then we obtain a moment around y, and this is going to be a positive bending moment because it tends to create tension in the first quadrant. Okay, so far so well. What about the last integral? The last integral comes from two contributions. Tau y z the area, which is a force in y direction. So this is T y z the area. Then this multiplies x, which is this distance here. And this leads to a moment around z. So this is a moment around z. The second contribution comes from tau xz times the area, which is a force in x direction. So this is tau xz the area. And when this multiplies y, it gives us a negative moment around z, where the positive twisting moment is a twisting moment around uh, z according to the right-hand rule. So combination of the of the two gives us the net moment around z at the cross section, which is, we can call it either mz, or since this is a twisting moment or a torque, we can use the more common notation and call it t. So essentially, what appears at the end of the day in the statement of the virtual work of internal forces of beams is a combination of the net forces and moments acting on the cross section. So we have three forces, a normal force and two shear forces, and three moments, two bending moments, and a twisting moment, which is a moment around the axis of the beam. So based on that, we can write down the final expression of the virtual work which is going to look something like this. And that would be the final expression of the internal, the virtual work of internal forces. It no longer explicitly depends on the detailed stress distribution over the cross section. Depends only on the resultant forces and and moments. And from here, we can start deriving the equations of equilibrium of the cross section. <coughs> 